Thank you so much, um, um, and thank you to uh, uh, Sophie and Michael and, and everybody at the Centre um, for, for this very kind invitation. It's really wonderful to be you, with you all um, uh, for this really excellent series. Um, uh, so yeah, this evening I am speaking on the topic of uh, women's activism in Scottish mosques. Um, so uh, as, as, as many of us familiar with, with the study of Muslims in Britain um, are aware, the questions around women in mosques feature very frequently in public and political discourse um, on Muslims in the UK. And um, in, indeed, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always a, it's a very per periodic um, discussion and conversation that, that uh, often arises um, sort of intermittently. I mean, not, not very long passes by before um, another conversation around women and women, women in, in mosques um, and women in Muslim communities uh, is part of the public and political discourse. Um, on one hand, we've got um, a situation where Muslim women recognize and seek out mosques for the community, for, for, for being community spaces of support, of spiritual nourishment and security, in particular in a context where they might feel um, marginalized or excluded in, in, in aspects of wider society. Uh, mosques are seen by some as um, something that should be a haven for them. Um, but in the UK, this has its difficulties if we consider the historical trajectory that's been traversed by Muslim communities as they've settled and grown um, and as their mosques and institutions have um, developed. So the range of mosques that we have in the UK is, is very uh, vast in terms of its um, in, in terms of what they look like, in terms of the services that they provide. Um, there isn't really a, a, a template or a model that's followed. So we have small musallas, which are basically rooms, prayer rooms where people turn up to, to say their five daily prayers as and when the time arrives, um, house conversions, church conversions, warehouse conversions. Um, you have purpose-built mosques, you have extended buildings and re-extended buildings and all the sort of messiness, if you like, that comes with that. Um, and the diversity of cultures and theological tendencies uh, that impact the extent or otherwise um, of women's inclusion in mosque spaces, um, they, they, they have this impact just as much as the circumstances of community and settlement, as community settlement and growth have also impacted the, the degree to which women um, are afforded space or otherwise, and what that space looks like and what that inclusion looks like. Um, in fact, as our chair today, uh, Dr. Ahmed is, is far more qualified than I am to tell you the story of the UK's mosques is uh, multi-layered and complicated in many ways. And uh, this is reflected in the rich and varied landscape, the buildings, the congregations, um, the governance, uh, spiritual services, prayer leadership um, that they offer, um, as well as a whole host of other um, features. Um, so in popular portrayals, the, the mention of women in the mosque um, is uh, something that often conjures up very sorry images of exclusion from the main prayer space, of inadequate provision of prayer space um, or poor facilities, uh, sort of women being shunted to sort of corners, um, uh, places that aren't you know, very well maintained, uh, very sort of erratic and periodic provision. Um, but on the other hand, so we, so we have that, but then on the other hand, we also um, see images um, that are portrayed of mosques as being uh, spaces of su su suspicion in public imagination. So a, a mysterious sort of shrouded, uh, closed um, building that, that, you know, uh, you need special permission to enter, um, that, uh, you know, this is an impression that's fed often through very sensationalized uh, media coverage of incidents of political violence. Um, as well as the counter extremism or counter terrorist terrorism uh, discourse and policy output. This is something in particular that um, Catherine Brown of Birmingham University's um, explored in her work. Um, so moving on to the images on this slide, actually, what I want to highlight here um, is one of the very first high profile campaigns around uh, disrupting the um, exclusion or poor provision for women in mosques, from mosques. Um, and this was in 2006. That's a still that I've got here of a documentary um, that covered uh, this campaign. It was a campaign that was run by the Muslim Public Affairs Committee or MPAC, um, which involved an organized series of targeted visits to mosques in various parts of the country by um, activists from this organization. 
And the campaign was filmed and televised as part of the, as I say, the Channel 4 Dispatches series under the quite dramatic headline of Women Only Jihad. So you see in this image, you've got um, a couple of women who have basically turned up at a mosque that they know. Um, so that they, they did their research in advance and they, they, they targeted mosques that exclude women, that don't provide a place for women to pray. And they decided to turn up at prayer time and demand that they are afforded a space to pray. Uh, so this still is an image of, of the of conversation that ensued when this incident unfolded at one of these mosques, I believe somewhere in the north of England. I, I'm not sure where this particular still is from. They visited several mosques. Um, so though this campaign was somewhat sensationalist in its framing and, and quite confrontational in its style, um, what the campaign did do is give um, this, this very long standing issue. I mean, it wasn't an issue that just arose at that time, but, but um, you know, it's, it's something that had been long standing and that many, um, you know, if you speak to Muslim women, um, you know, of, of various sort of ages and generations, they will all allude to this and, and, and talk about their experiences around exclusion in mosques. Um, but it gets, so it gave this um, long standing issue of visibility and exposure. In particular, um, this exposure was aided by some of the responses that were given by male mosque officials or commentators on this film who were often caught unawares and, um, you know, gave what, what came across as weak or tone deaf responses to the campaigners. So, though this, though high profile in terms of its media coverage, its campaign was, for various reasons, something of a flash in the pan. Um, and the issue, so although the campaign petered out, um, the issue continued, um, as many Muslim women and young people will tell you, due to persistent obstacles that they face. Um, however, with the proliferation after that, since then, really, of uh, digital and social media communication and networking around this issue, as with many others, was facilitated and validated. Um, and, 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 and experiences were validated and confidence was sort of shared and, and given, um, uh, as well as exchange of creative ideas by women activists uh, seeking to um, uh, gain better inclusion and participation in mosques as they networked and communicated with one another. And this is not just sort of something that's restricted to UK. Um, you know, there was plenty of, obviously, and there continues to be plenty of networking between um, women um, cross borders, and you know, especially transatlantically um, around this issue. Uh, so if you fast forward a little bit to today, um, the other images I've got here um, tell, tell another story. So we've got um, the, 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 the top one, Visit My Mosque, is um, a campaign that um, was initiated by the Muslim Council of Britain in uh, 2015. And uh, this was um, a response to a lot of, um, well, well, sort of a lot of mosques were being attacked. There were sort of fight far right campaigns against mosques and against Muslim communities and a lot of sort of um, capitalizing on this sort of element of mystery around mosques. And uh, something that the MCB spearheaded was this idea of opening up mosques, having a mosque open day once a year and um, encouraging mosques to open their doors to their communities and you know, partake in various neighborly activities uh, with one another. Um, now, all very laudable and many people obviously saw this as a very, um, you know, a rich opportunity for communities to come together and, and to dispel myths and uh, to educate one another. Um, but an interesting response to this was something that came from Muslim women's groups um, or Muslim women activists who argued, well, okay, this is all great, but we as Muslim women, when, when are we, when are mosques going to be open to us? When are we going to be invited to visit our mosques? In fact, we are banned and, and barred from visiting our mosques. And so they set up like a counter sort of a response really to this and they called it Open My Mosque. And the idea behind that was, well, yeah, I mean, it's all well and good to invite our local sort of uh, reverend or uh, rabbi or, you know, school head teacher, whoever to our mosque, um, but we as Muslim women are denied access to mosques on a daily basis. So I want to open my mosque. Um, and the idea behind this campaign was really, it was very social media focused, but also involved conversations uh, on the ground. Um, uh, you know, people took to highlighting um, substandard provision in mosques for women, uh, exclusion, um, and various issues that they were uncomfortable with, but also showcasing examples of good practice. Um, and again, culmination, uh, culmination of conversations that came out of this, um, as well as other factors and other sort of wider conversations that fed into a further um, sort of um, development, which was a couple of years after that, 
um, uh, a response by, and uh, you know, I'm using the MCB here as an example because um, of, of its status, I guess, as a high profile organization, but there have been many other uh, Muslim organizations that have responded similarly to women's um, vocal uh, anxieties and concerns around being excluded from mosques. Um, so, so what, what came out of this conversation around open my mosque in response to visit my mosque was um, a, a more holistic approach uh, by the MCB to uh, look at, uh, you know, empowering capacity building in mosques and a very um, sort of strong strand within the, the, the project that they developed into what's now known as Our Mosques, Our Future is uh, something called a Women in Mosques Development Program. And that's involves specifically training women uh, to take on leadership positions in mosques, um, speaking to mosques and, and educating mosque uh, leaders and organizers around uh, being more inclusive in, in terms of how they run their mosques and, um, and how they organize them. So, so what we've seen, and, and this is on a sort of UK level, uh, that ha has been what have often started as local uh, organic movements or online networking endeavors to document and share experiences. Um, though they haven't been coordinated in a centralized way, they've often snowballed and grown um, through conversation with one another, uh, sort of, you know, events happening and then responding to, to, to those events and, and building on that really. Um, uh, so, um, so this is sort of just laying the scene. Uh, I'll, moving on to that, moving on from that, if, if, uh, if we can move on to the next slide. Um, I just want to illustrate where I'm coming from in terms of this specific study um, around uh, women's activism in Scottish mosques. So my starting point builds on uh, work that I did um, in my book, uh, Muslim Identity Politics. One of the ideas that I put forward in this book is the notion of an equality gap that faces Muslim activists in the UK uh, public space. So bear with me while I make this um, uh, while, while I explain how I got from, from point A to point B. So, uh, so the argument behind this idea of inequality gap is really identifying that there have been and continue to be structural issues impeding um, full and equal standing or participation of Muslims in society. And this includes things like official um, legal barriers. So for instance, weak protection in the law against religious discrimination. Um, it, it includes discriminatory legal instruments which render Muslims a suspect community to, for instance, discrimination being tacitly enabled by political culture uh, through discourse or gesturing from um, politicians or um, public figures. Um, now, one of the considerations that came out of my discussions in, in, in writing this and the research behind it um, cropped up a lot and it was something that I was acutely aware of being somebody from coming from within Muslim communities is that, you know, Muslim communities, Muslim activists do face this equality gap in many ways and it manifests itself in, 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 shifting, um, uh, in, in shifting ways over time. Um, but also that there are and there have been and continue to be equality, uh, equality gaps within Muslim spaces. So in the sense there are people at the periphery who've been marginalized and who don't have the same access to um, equality uh, or, 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 or have been shut out or face discrimination within Muslim spaces. And so what I, um, so this is where I'm coming from in terms of looking at women's um, activism in mosques, how they're seeking to redress and speak up against the equality gap as they experience it. Um, and uh, obviously, I, you know, I want to highlight that women aren't the only sort of subset within Muslim communities that face inequalities or discrimination or marginalization, but this is what I'm looking at um, in this moment. So uh, the questions that I'm really asking when I'm approaching this is, um, you know, asking, you know, speaking to the women that I, that I speak to, asking how, um, how they feel that they've been included or excluded and considering the methods that they've used as activists. Um, in bringing about change towards narrowing this gap. So this is an ongoing project that I've been conducting uh, through um, various forms of participant observation among uh, women's groups and spaces, including in mosques, although a lot of it's now virtual through attending uh, various um, uh, sort of online uh, uh, events or, or, or activities. Um, I've, I've been doing targeted interviews with selected activists 
And in particular, I've been following an organization called Vibrant Scottish Mosques, which has emerged over the past couple of years um, with which I've been in conversation and um, have actually recently been asked to join their advisory board. So um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna start with a question that I think is, is not new to anybody probably who's, who's on here. It's been, it's been sort of uh, sitting on our headlines for, for the past couple of weeks. Uh, how many female Imams are there? Now, this is a question which uh, was posed by the newly elected Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, posed to the, the newly elected Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain by um, an interviewer on Women's Hour um, in an interview shortly after her election. Um, and I, I wanted to revisit this question, not because of all the controversy that's come out of it, um, but because I think just the very posing of the question and the repeated posing, that, that whole scenario captured quite concisely um, the, the whole, whole range of issues surrounding the place of women in British mosques and the pressures and the challenges that they face uh, from outside their communities and from within them. Um, and I think it also quite importantly illustrates some of the difficulties that women activists um, face in, in trying to speak up about uh, the, their experiences, their own experiences of exclusion and, and marginalization and that sort of the double bind that they find themselves in. They also find themselves quite trapped in between a whole range of different pressures. So without focusing on the exchange itself uh, that, that sort of ensued between Zara and her interviewer, um, but I, I want to look at the, the tone and the approach of questioning. Um, so the, the question presumes obviously that there is um, some, there, the, the, that there's an issue right um, around the, the you know the, the, to be asking how many female imams are there. It's a, it's a question that's that's relating to the idea that that you know that there, there aren't many female imams right and that there are more the norm is for there to be male imams and um, that maybe the, the notion of there being female imams or that there should be more female imams is a question of women's empowerment. Um, and so um, it relates obviously to, to the idea of, of women in mosques in the, in the sense that an imam is, is typically in our minds, uh, a prayer leader who uh, leads prayers in mosques, although as we all know that the role of an imam is, can be, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not something that's very firmly defined and can be, um, can include so much more than just that. But um, so, so to, to go to back to the question, the hostility of the questioning itself um, betrayed this pervasiveness of Islamophobia in the context of media coverage on Islam and Muslim issues um, and the constraining impact it has on Muslim women and their ability to speak openly or authentically in public space. Um, but more precisely, it demonstrated a sort of a zero sum game that Muslims are presented with, whether, you know, that, that in this kind of questioning, there's this expectation that a good answer would have conformed to majority or establishment norms or demonstrated an adherence to values as conceived of by a normal, norm, normative uh, liberal culture. Um, so this insistence of female imams on female imams, even as, even as Zara Muhammad tried to unpack the question and channel it towards a more nuanced understanding of what faith leadership can look like um, in the UK Muslim communities, um, it was it wasn't it wasn't enough. There, there, there was this persistence on this question of how many, but you haven't told me how many female imams are there, have you? Um, I think this notion is something that actually um, a recent book published by uh, my colleague Stephen Jones really looks at a lot more um, a conundrum that Muslims engaging in the public sphere really face and, 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 and are almost put into an impossible situation. Um, so uh, shout out to his book, Islam and the Liberal State, uh, look it up. Um, now, um, for many people, this was um, a, a, an emblematic case of the challenges that were faced by Muslim women activists from what, what, what's referred to popularly as this idea of white liberal feminism. So it's, it's sort of caricatured as a, as a privileged myopic exclusivist iteration of feminism that's not attuned to the intersectional struggles of women from minority and disadvantaged uh, communities. So that's one obstacle that Muslim women activists are faced, are faced with when they try to speak out against disadvantage and discrimination that they, uh, that they experience in their communities. But also there's this backdrop of, um, of the whole uh, securitization 
uh, environment of, of uh, countering violent extremism, prevent, um, that has Muslim uh, representatives and commentators constantly on the back foot having to demonstrate or prove their worth or their acceptability to um, values that are that, that are um, deciphered by the state um, and and set out by the state in terms of you know a, a precondition for people to sign up to but at the same time through accepting these premises um, and the implications of, of, of problematic discourses around what a good Muslim looks like or what a worthy or acceptable Muslim activist looks like um, or being co-opted by such schemes, often schemes be, that, that target specifically actually women's empowerment or notions of women's activism, they then lose credibility or standing um, that, that's obviously a prerequisite to um, making an impact within their communities. So uh, an activist, I mean, you know, this isn't commentary on, on, on Zara at all, personally, I don't know her well enough or her, um, or her views, but I, I, I found myself really seeing playing, playing out in that moment thinking of so many other instances where Muslim women activists, whether in a high profile situation or something much more localized um, and, and uh, you know, a, a much quieter situation are faced with these um, dilemmas where, you know, if they, if they want to speak out against something in their community, they feel that they're sort of bringing, um, exposing the community, if they want to speak out against injustice in their community, that they feel that they're, they're pressured um, for exposing the community to um, forces that might undermine good work within the community or restrict um, other freedoms, um, whether it be through Islamophobia or through the, the whole countering extremism um, complex. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just before before I hone in on Scotland, um, I, I, just to place um, the the activism uh, of, of women in um, in mosques in into wider context, um, and to sort of illustrate some of the, the these dilemmas that I spoke about earlier, um, I've got, I've got three examples here. So one of them, um, though she's in Denmark, Shireen Khan Khan, who is on the left um, of my screen. Um, with uh, President Macron in France, um, uh, you know, she's, she's had interactions with groups in the UK and her work is followed by people in the UK, so I, I felt that she would be a relevant illustration here of, um, you know, th this dilemma around um, playing the good Muslim, really, and I think it, uh, she's really interesting because actually she doesn't, in her work as an imam um, of a mosque, she, she doesn't push any theological boundaries as such, in the sense that she doesn't lead um, a, a mixed gender prayer, which is a major sticking point for orthodox uh, theology. Um, and her role slots in very neatly into a narrative around national, national religion, um, approved religion and securitization. Um, and so this is something that people look to from within Muslim communities as, um, with, with a lot of caution and, and a suspicion really, because um, obviously, you know, we're all aware of, for instance, uh, Macron's own agenda around uh, securitizing Muslim communities and shutting down charities, um, schools, mosques. So, so that's something that raises a lot of question marks. Um, and so by default, it erodes her um, credibility among grassroots communities uh, who are feeling quite beleaguered by a lot of uh, the political and policy choices of uh, the people that she you know, deems fit to mix with. Um, another example I'm highlighting here is the Inclusive Mosque, which is um, based in London. This is the top right-hand corner. As you can see, it's a mixed um, prayer led by a woman, which is, um, yeah, as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's um, absolutely challenges orthodox uh, theological interpretations. It presents itself as a haven to all marginalized uh, groups and voices, but disrupts the expectation that it will offer itself up as a good Muslim project. Um, uh, inverted commas, uh, uh, by vocally disavowing this notion of state Islam and um, it contextualizes itself within the, a wider landscape um, among other grassroots initiatives. Um, so, so this is a, a really interesting example uh, for something that's managed to hold on to its authenticity within communities by not playing the, the sort of, by not entering into this um, securitization uh, 
uh, realm uh, or not buying into this idea of, of a, a compliant liberal state Islam, um, but at the same time interrogating orthodox theological interpretations and offering something that they consider to be uh, more inclusive uh, for people who, who feel that they can't find their place in um, conventional mosque spaces. Um, and my final example is uh, the women-led mosque project, which is run by the Muslim Women's Council based in Bradford, um, which has followed a much more cautious approach in terms of theology. So um, the mosque that they seek to build is um, very traditional in terms of, um, you know, it's, it's theology sticking to very orthodox interpretations of what a congregation looks like, what a prayer leader looks like. But in terms of its administration um, and executive decisions, it, um, it's led by women. And what they've done in order to, you know, gain credibility in, in what they consider to be, you know, is, is just go, I'm going by what they have told me, um, are quite a closed um, uh, and insular community. Um, they've, they've sought out endorsement from respected uh, and recognized religious leaders. Um, many of the men as a way to demonstrate um, their legitimacy. Um, so this is the wider landscape. If we can uh, move to the next slide, please. Sorry, if, if we could move to the next slide, that'd be appreciated. Yeah, so, uh, so this is a wider landscape. What I want to do here is, is take us um, much closer in than on Scotland. And, um, and I, 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 you know, obviously it goes without saying that Scotland's been, um, the issues around women's inclusion or exclusion of mosques have been no less of an issue in Scotland than elsewhere. And there have been recurrent reported incidents where women seeking better accommodation and inclusion in mosques um, have, have faced sort of, uh, well, responses and challenges in particular, most notably, I think, in, in Glasgow Central Mosque um, on several occasions. So what I want to do here is, um, before, before I look at some of the strategies that um, have characterized women's activism in Scottish mosques, uh, I want to take some time to look at the key issues that have been highlighted by selection of my research participants. So all of the women that I've spoken to that I'm, that I'm going to um, present um, their words to you here um, are women who um, have been occupying longstanding um, activist roles and, and, and have given a lot of community service. Uh, within uh, mosque spaces, but also in wider communities. And um, a quick summary of, of some of the main issues that they've raised include that, you know, they don't see their mosques just as a space to play, uh, to pray, apologies, although this is something that is nonetheless emphasized by them. Um, people talk about uh, the atmosphere and environment, um, excluding them or making them feel unwelcome, or making things difficult for them. They talk about governance, uh, they talk about the content or the relevance, the substance of the religious and spiritual uh, teaching and leadership that's offered at these mosques, and they talk about sense of injustice that they feel. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so I, 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 just to obviously say that um, the names that I'm using here have been changed for anonymity. Um, one of my, uh, Sarah, who, who, who I quote here, um, leads a Muslim women's organization and um, she's, she's got a sort of a lot of experience of working with women in vulnerable situations um, but is herself somebody who described herself she told me that she um, she, she, she takes a lot of um, personal pleasure in visiting mosques she finds them aesthetically pleasing she loves to take photographs of mosques she, she, she sees them as a haven for herself um, so she spoke to me about the atmosphere she finds in mosques and she says, okay, well, even if they provide services, if these mosques, um, you know, they, they have consultation with women, they listen to what they want and they try to give them access, you know, they, they have classes for children or dad's groups for, for, for women, so classes for women as well. Um, it still feels that they turn into men's clubs. So she's talking about the atmosphere that they have. Um, and then she talks about um, her experiences. She tries to sort of go in. It's not facilitated. So there is an entrance that she can go into, but she feels that she's judged somewhat. She, she alludes to maybe the way she dresses. And she says, okay, well, maybe that makes me, um, you know, somebody who's um, people are suspicious of or feel uncomfortable with or look down upon, she says. Um, and I always wonder um, whether it would make a difference if I was dressed differently in a way that people might have been more comfortable with and you know she feels excluded because of that. She also goes on to talk about the, the entrance that she is offered um, as a woman, that it's something on the side and it's not the main entrance and that also makes her feel 
um, belittled. Um, so if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, and uh, the sense of injustice that I mentioned, she, she was the same, the same respondent, Sara, talks about how, um, and, and it's something that I, that I come across a lot, actually, this, this idea that, you know, women very readily contribute to mosques projects, whether it's through fundraising, people have also spoken to me about the fact that they give up a lot of their voluntary service, a lot of time in terms of keeping mosques clean, in terms of keeping them maintained, making them look pretty. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, running running various activities for young people. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah. So she says. Um, sorry, I don't know why my screen keeps flashing. Is that from? That's not from you guys, is it? Uh, right. Okay. Um, uh, so, so there's a sense that we've we've invested so much uh, to the situation, um, but. Um, we're not getting anything in return, we're belittled, we're put to the side, um, and we um, are not treated very well as a result. Um, uh, so there's no recognition given to uh, what it is that, we, um, what, what, that we've given to this mosque. Um, so, so yeah, if we can move on to the next the slide, please. Um, apologies, I'd, I've been having an issue with my screen. Um, right, okay. Uh, so uh, again, quoting Sara, she talks about accessibility. She talks about how mosques in terms of their, their um, uh, architecture aren't designed with women in mind, aren't designed with people who have um, access issues in mind. Um, so she'll, she'll talk, uh, she talks about, as I said, the aesthetics, how there's a grand entrance for men and women um, have a fire exit, um, but also that they have to go up um, lots of flights of stairs, um, you know, uh, mobility isn't um, considered for the elderly or people who have young children. Um, and then she talks about how actually, you know, even once you get to the prayer space, it's not well maintained. There's a vacuum cleaner in the corner, there's boxes, there's, you know, it's used as a storage space. Um, it's not something that's treasured or that's kept um, uh, in good condition for people who, uh, who are visiting, you know, and, and that, that uh, obviously is a sign of disrespect. Um, so, yeah, if we can move on to the next one, please, as well. Um, so, so um, another respondent, Sadia, who also runs a, a separate women's organization, um, tells me about, um, how, um, you know, one of the things she spoke to me about a lot actually was how um, the, the process that she went through um, to gain the trust of um, people, officials in the mosque, basically, how she had to prove herself, how she had to get various people to vouch for her. Um, but one of her biggest bugbears that she raised was this idea that um, the content of um, uh, Friday sermons or teaching in general in the mosques uh, was irrelevant to everyday life. So she was saying, well, you know, I just wish that you know, when I took my kids to the mosque, they'd be able to sit and listen to something that um, was just as fascinating as what they might hear at school, for instance, um, or that really sort of stretched their critical thinking in the same way. Um, so she was saying, you know, in the khutbahs, we, we should be talking about science um, instead of just talking about uh, what happened with the Sahaba, Sahaba being um, the uh, men and women around the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So she was saying, um, you know, okay, yeah, so the Sahaba did a lot of good things, um, but we can't relate to that because it happened a long time ago. It's about remaining relevant. Um, and uh, the people responsible for, for the messaging that's coming out of the mosque, for the teaching that's coming out of the mosque, um, she critiques them and she says they're, they're not making it relevant to life today. Um, you know, it's fine to learn from the Sahaba, but, um, you know, we're hearing are just regurgitated stories, basically. We're not um, seeing or hearing attempts to make them relevant to the challenges that we uh, are facing in the here and now. Um, as a bit more in the next slide, if you could bring that up, please, as well. Um, so she goes on to say that, okay, well, Islam's a forward-thinking religion. Um, people should be able to experience to quote her, whatever's happening in today's society. So she, she brings up a, a challenge that she that she comes across a lot, questions around homosexuality, identity, uh, and, and she says, you know, I'm sure that there were issues like this that arose at the time of the Prophet, 
why don't we talk about how he dealt with it? Why don't we learn from that? Why don't we think about our responses as Muslims to these issues? And she feels that mosques are shying away from difficult issues, basically, and it's sticking in kind of safe um, areas. Um, and, and that's something that makes her feel excluded in the sense that she feels that she doesn't, it's not a place that she wants to bring her children to. She's not a place that she wants to um, advise young people uh, to seek uh, advice from or to, to go to to learn from because it, she feels that the, the messaging that's coming out, the teaching that's coming out is inadequate and ill-equipped and irrelevant to deal with uh, modern day challenges. So, um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, and uh, another respondent, um, now Nasreen is an interesting one because she's the only, um, uh, to my knowledge, the only female member of a mosque committee in uh, Edinburgh. And um, we spoke a lot about her process, the process that she went through to join um, the mosque committee and um, you know how she felt about that um, and, and what her role um, looks like. Um, and I'll go on to talk a bit that a, a bit about that, but but for now I'm looking at some of her um, um, conversation uh, that we had about um, about again irrelevance and issues. And so she she talks a bit about um, uh, sexual abuse, which which for her um, is is a very serious issue that you know in her professional life she has to deal with, um, and so she feels very strongly about it. And she was saying, well, yeah, um, you know. People don't realize, people in the mosques, people, the mosque committee members don't even know what's going on. They don't acknowledge that this is an issue. Um, not only does it happen, but it happens in mosques and uh, people have their heads in the sand. Uh, why is that? So she's, she's again, she's emphasizing this point that people who run mosques um, are not in touch with reality and that this is something for her as a woman, as a mother, um, as a professional, uh, makes her excluded, makes her feel excluded and out of touch in um, mosque spaces. Um, so yes, uh, next slide, please. So yeah, to, to, to return to Nasreen and, and her experience of being in uh, the mosque committee. So Nasreen is in her forties and she tells me that she's the youngest person by a long shot um, on the mosque committee of her mosque. Um, and uh, so she was telling me about her experience of, um, uh, of, of basically whether whether, she, whether her, her voice is given weight on the committee, how people perceive her. And her um, argument um, was that, um, you know, her age plays a big role in, in people taking her seriously in the mosque space. And she says, you know, if I was younger, if I'd been in my twenties, I wouldn't have personally, I wouldn't have had the confidence to speak um, firmly um, um, in, in, this, in this committee space because I'm surrounded by elderly men who, as she alluded to in her earlier, um, in the quote that I gave earlier, um, are out of touch or who don't, you know, fully appreciate the the the, the issues that I'm arguing about and that I'm raising. Um, but because I'm older, because I've got experiences, because I'm a mother and they know me, I'm a known quantity. There's something again that a lot of people felt that they had to prove before they were taken seriously. Um, because I'm a known quantity, um, I feel that I can speak. I'm gonna realize. Um, time is um, not in my favor. So yeah, let's skip to the next slide, please. Um, actually, if we could, yeah, if you could move on to the, to the slide after that, um, because I want to give a little bit of time for questions. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so just to wind up, I'm, what I want to highlight here is this organization, um, which, uh, as I say, has been around for a couple of years, but still very much in its um, evolutionary early stages, uh, vibrant Scottish mosques. And I think the strategy that they're following is, is quite interesting and unique in some ways compared to the, the wider landscape, which I've just um, uh, illustrated. Um, so they've been bringing on board people from, from a whole range of backgrounds. And um, rather than um, sort of being uh, short-lived, or um, online only sort of uh, uh, campaigns as some of the, the, the campaigns that I've um, highlighted have tended to be. Um, uh, and very consciously navigating the, the challenges around Muslim women's vocaliz vocal activism that I've uh, raised with, with the example that I gave around Zara Muhammad's interview, uh, the people behind Vibrant Scottish Mosques um, have uh, sort of been very, uh, pushing some what I, what I call a very conciliatory approach and what they've been doing um, in, in, in order to, to achieve this 
has been bringing on board a, a very mixed member, a, a very mixed uh, sort of selection of board members comprising of men and women from across different uh, community, professional and geographic areas So they've covered various parts of Scotland. They're not um, sort of even even though they, you know, the, the, the majority of Muslims in Scotland are based in Glasgow, that you'll find pockets of Muslims in, in all, up and down um, Scotland, but also very much in the main cities and they've managed to cover that. Um, I think they've benefited a great deal from the Scottish context in the sense that the Muslim population of Scotland is quite small. So I always like to give the comparison that in the 2011 census, sure it's, it's, it's dated, but in terms of proportion, um, the population of Scotland is pretty much less, a little bit less than the uh, population of Muslims in uh, Tower Hamlets in East London. So this is just to give you an idea. Um, so there is a lot of informality and familiarity within uh, Muslim community spaces in Scotland, and that really helps in terms of people um, being able to network, but also people actually just developing trust um, between one another. Um, so people joke and say that, you know, rather than six degrees of separation, there's a one degree of separation between Muslims and Scotland. And I think to some extent that there is some truth in that. Um, uh, they've also linked up with um, a lot of the other um, initiatives that have preceded them and learned from them and been listening to them um, and sort of uh, very consciously been taking a gradual approach through, for instance, commissioning a research exercise, organizing networking meetings, uh, meeting with mosque leaders, um, focus group um, uh, events with, with people to actually just listen to what it is that they're after. Um, and I think an, an interesting example of really, of, of how this conciliatory approach, I think, um, is, is panning out, I think, um, that I want to highlight is, is how even the title of this initiative um, was amended after consultation with various um, members of the community. So that when they first started up, they were calling themselves Scottish Mosques for All. And I think there was some unease and apprehension around, you know, what does for all mean? What is exactly is it that you want to do? What is exactly your remit? And, you know, I talked earlier about how there were sort of theological apprehensions about what inclusivity looks like in, uh, in, in mosque activism. And I think their response to this was to very clearly define what it is that their remit is. They're talking specifically about representation and inclusion of women. Um, and that was interesting to see because I mean, this is a conversation that's happening. It's not, you know, if we, if we think back to the example that I gave of impact at the very beginning in 2006, that was very confrontational. That was, you know, these are our terms, take it or leave it. And there was a clear clash and, um, uh, you know, in terms of what was achieved, you know, there's very little to show for it, other than putting the issue on the table, which obviously is not something um, small. But I think with, with the VSM, um, you know, obviously it's yet to be seen how the mosque, uh, how the, how the organisation is going to develop and uh, where it's going to go. But I think it's an interesting case study that I'm, you know, following quite closely with, with a lot of interest and in, um, uh, in, in terms of how a conciliatory approach in a small area, small geographic um, and uh, small geographic informal area is um, able to make gains and uh, make long lasting impact potentially. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for having me, I'll end it there. Um...